Welcome back to the conference. I hope you enjoyed lunch. Now, this afternoon, we will actually uh, hold a, a panel discussion about the uh, current and future challenges of research and development in Tanzania. Uh, on stage, we have uh, Professor Mohammed Garib Bilal, former vice president and nuclear scientist, Florence Luoga, professor uh, and acting vice chancellor, University of Dar es Salaam, Dr. Hassan Mashinda, senior researcher, former director general at Kostek. We will, on the other side, uh, Professor Winnie Aster Anderson, Associate Professor at the University of Dar es Salaam Business School. And at the end, Professor Rolf Johansson, uh, Professor Emeritus at the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences, SLU. And Mrs. Anna Maria Ultorp, Head of Research Unit, SIDA. Welcome, all of you. During the 40 years uh, of cooperation between Tanzania and Sweden, the research cooperation, uh, Tanzania's capacity for research has increased uh, dramatically. Still, there are challenges, and I would like you to point out some of the major challenges uh, in, I mean, that we have to, uh, to get past to get a sustainable research environment in, in Tanzania. And I would like to ask Professor Mohammed Gari Bilal, uh, is that something you would like to start to speak about? Do you have, you have a microphone over there? I Main challenges. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. First I must say good afternoon to everybody. I hope you are all awake and you had a nice cup of coffee after lunch. Let me begin by first expressing my sincere gratitude for the invitation to this very important event, which commemorates 40 years of Swedish support in research in Tanzania. This, I'm also grateful for being given the opportunity to serve in this panel of very distinguished people and friends whom I have known for so many years, some of you and others I'm knowing them for the first time today. But nevertheless, I think it's going to be a very informative discussion and panel uh, discussion this afternoon. It is only natural for me to base my presentation on my experience at the University of Dar es Salaam, and particularly in the Department of Physics, because that's where I spent at least 12 years of my life as a member of staff in the physics department. Over the past few decades, the Department of Physics has benefited immensely from the support of the Swedish grants and sponsorship for our students. At the beginning, the university, the Department of Physics used to receive 10 months 10 months fellowship through Uppsala to study in the, physics, in, in the physics laboratories in Sweden to do sandwich programs, masters of science in various areas of physics. For example, laser physics, X-ray fluorescence, solar energy, material science, and so on. This support that we used to receive culminated in the building of a very successful laboratory in material science in the physics department at the University of Dar es Salaam. I think it's one of the showcase of the support that we have received from Sweden. The laboratory right now is manned by graduates from the University of Dar es Salaam and graduates also from other from universities in Sweden, either through sandwich programs or through direct fellowships to Sweden. We have trained a lot of staff, very capable people in the, in the Department of Physics in Sciences, particularly in Material Sciences, and we have built a laboratory which is furnished with state-of-the-art equipment that, that, comparable to what you would find in any good research laboratory in the world today. So we are most grateful for the support that we have received from Sweden for building research activities in Dar es Salaam. 
As a matter of fact, the research cooperation can be easily divided into two phases. The first phase was simply to train people to become members of staff to receive degrees in Masters of Science and perhaps PhD, but later on it graduated into funding to a specific research group. And SAREC chose to fund material science group at the University of Dar es Salaam in the Department of Physics. We were lucky to get cooperation with the Swedish laboratories, and as a result of that, we managed to train not only our own members of staff from masters to PhD degrees, but also even people from other universities in the region used to take advantage of the facilities that were created at the University of Dar es Salaam. We are enjoying quite a wonderful cooperation with our neighbors in the East African region and, and beyond for that matter. And also through the help of the CEDA support, we have been able to establish, to hold conferences, to establish cooperation with the other universities in the region, and also to do quality research that can be published in international journals. It's only recently, fortunately or rather unfortunately, we had a conference at the, Physics at the University of Dar es Salaam that was sponsored again by CEDA. And when I say CEDA, I also mean CEDA and other agency working with CEDA, such as International Program in the Physical Sciences, based in Uppsala, and other agencies like SAREC before. These are all, as far as I'm concerned, CEDA projects. But we held a conference, as I said, fortunately and unfortunately. The conference was to commemorate the contribution of one of our very able scientists and excellent physicists who passed away only last year, if I can recall correctly, Professor Rogas Kivaisi, who was trained at the University of Dar es Salaam, and also with the Institute program at Gothenburg University in Sweden. He received his PhD in Sweden, in Sweden, but he got his master's through a sandwich program that was sponsored jointly by the University of Dar es Salaam and the Swedish University. So we held a meeting in which we were remembering his contribution because he was the one who, is, who worked hard to build the material science laboratory in the physics department at the University of Dar es Salaam. The research work init was initiated to do work in solar energy, in material science for solar energy, solar cooling, uh, what you might say, intelligent windows, uh, and others properties of materials that is needed in order to make good use of the solar energy and also to make living in many houses and in buildings more comfortable because of uh, eliminating heat that might be absorbed. Mm. Uh, Dr. Bilal, uh, we have to look also forward in this panel. What would you say are the main challenges? I'm coming to that. Okay, good. <laughs> As I said, the initial objective was to build training for local people in there. But then, as it happens, that if you are asking for challenges, one of the challenges that we have to maintain this laboratory, to make sure that the laboratory will continue to be there and also to perform the way it is performing. We want to see more cooperation with our neighbors in the region. We want to see ownership on the part of the on the part of the we want to see more ownership on the part of the of Tanzania. Mm. How can we handle sustainability? Sustainability mm. in the future. And it is also very important to make sure that uh, we continue have to, we, we continue to have a flow of brilliant young people coming into the department mm. and retain them 
so that we can do more research and also promote cooperation in the region mm. and, and also development in Tanzania for that matter. Mm. But what I can say about what is going on at the University of Dar es Salaam in the Department of Physics is that we are building capacity to do research in various areas in material sciences. It can be a place for training for others, but also a place where we can accumulate knowledge on so much properties of materials that can be used in other areas, not necessarily in solar energy, but in other areas. For example, recently one of the most interesting topics that has emerged is artificial photosynthesis. Well, you think of photosynthesis and you think of photosynthesis as something that is done by the, uh, a plant leaf. But you can think of it as a process that is going on through photosynthesis can also be mimicked by solar materials or materials that have been evaporated on a substrate and they can have the same properties as the photosynthesis in the, that is taking place in the leaves. The challenges that we are having is to make sure, first of all, how do we make people realize that the study of exotic subjects such as material sciences is actually something that is useful to society. And, and knowledge in the sciences can be thought of as of two types, the experimental knowledge and the theoretical studies. Experimental work is very difficult because you need laboratories, you need materials, consumables, and you need technicians to work on, on the material that you have. Theoretical physics, you can do theoretical physics without the laboratory. What we need perhaps today in the current world of the web is just have a good connection to other scientists. But also you do need sometimes the time to communicate with others, to associate with other people in the same field so that you can understand what is going on in other places. Mm. Um. I was going to ask also, uh, Professor Luoga, from your perspective, what would you say are the main challenges uh, in order to build a sustainable uh, research environment? Thank you. Uh, let me start by making an observation that uh, the creation of a sustainable research environment Creation of a sustainable research environment is not uh, a, an, a, an individual endeavor. Uh, everyone has to uh, participate in the sense that um, uh, one, research has no boundaries, has no borders, and therefore it needs uh, collaborative uh, effort uh, by all researchers around the world. But uh, two, uh, in order to have a sustaining research uh, environment, it means uh, we have to really uh, uh, ensure effective collaboration of all stakeholders, governments, institutions, uh, the researchers, it requires building relationships because uh, research is also a product of uh, demand. Uh, if uh, you don't have much demand, there is less drive and uh, less interest by the researchers to take up challenges. And uh, therefore, it's something that comes up ultimately as part of, uh, uh, I believe, the culture that we should cultivate wherever we are to see the need for research in order to obtain solution, to get solutions. And uh, collaboration both at national and international uh, level. Uh, because at the end of the day, research has to save humanity. And uh, in that context, we are all responsible to collaborate in order to ensure the sustenance of uh, research. But then there are uh, a number of issues that are uh, uh, important, for instance, uh, in Tanzania. One which uh, we see that uh, uh, through the 40 years co collaboration, 
uh, has brought up now uh, has facilitated at least to move into achieving one is the question of uh, a mindset. Uh, in the past, uh, in uh, uh, many parts, especially in our countries, our scholars uh, were taking research uh, more as uh, an income generation or income earning activity and uh, not because uh, it's a responsibility. Uh, in, this, in, 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 in this aspect, I want to uh, distinguish between uh, purely consultants that is undertaking, undertaken and research. Research requires a scholarship in the sense that you don't, you, you don't simply do something in order to deliver results to a person who employs you to do that. You have to do something in order to generate knowledge and solution so that uh, a, the research output is capable of informing, for instance, uh, the policy pro processes in order to uh, generate uh, solutions and even create uh, uh, systems. And uh, this is very important. And I see that uh, the, the, the impact of the collaboration, for instance, is the change in the mindset. Uh, many of our researchers today uh, take research very seriously and strive to involve stakeholders in developing research agenda, uh, which is uh, very, uh, very important. Uh, two, uh, to have uh, a sustaining research environment, it, it, it requires that uh, we must have a very effective way of communication of research uh, results. Uh, without means of communication, then uh, uh, research uh, is stunted. Uh, because uh, those who need the output of research are not capable of accessing the output and uh, making use of uh, uh, the uh, knowledge that is uh, being uh, uh, generated. Uh, also, I think it's a challenge that um, uh, we do research in order to provide solution, but we cannot forget the fact that uh, we do research in order to generate knowledge. Uh, somehow, uh, there is uh, always that uh, uh, I mean, that uh, uh, distance between uh, uh, basic research and research that is immediately required to address certain, uh, certain problems. As researchers, it's uh, our responsibility as institutions to make sure that uh, uh, basic research continues. It's not uh, neglected because at the end of the day, if you, we don't have knowledge, it means a lot of things may end up uh, uh, coming to a stand still. No new challenges are arising because there is no thinking. Mm -hmm. So this is a challenge, how to sustain basic research alongside uh, applied research. Okay. Also, uh, it is a challenge that uh, we need um, uh, to, uh, to address we must continue creating or, uh, uh, I mean, creating researchers. Uh, you are not born a researcher. <laughs> uh, you, somehow you must be equipped to be a researcher. Uh, that's why as uh, academic institutions, we strive to equip our members of staff uh, with the skills of uh, a inquiry, of uh, research, understanding research uh, ethics, uh, a scholarship in uh, research. Uh, so training part of it becomes uh, a challenge that is ongoing. Uh, our institutions know this, and uh, I, I, I believe uh, our gathering here today is a proof that uh, we have to train more researchers uh, to sustain research. And uh, the programs that have been going on and are still going on uh, are addressing that aspect quite well. And the demand for researchers is quite huge. So I don't expect that uh, there will come a time when we say that uh, we have enough researchers and uh, we can forget training. So 
So far as this is uh, an ongoing demand, it will remain as a challenge uh, to uh, all of us. And uh, as I said, research has no borders. And because it has no borders, uh, the challenge which is always there is to make sure that uh, there is effective mobilization of uh, collaboration world over to make sure that uh, a, there is a collaboration in research, interdisciplinarity in research, uh, in order to sustain research. There are a lot of challenges, but uh, for the time being, I thought uh, those are the few that uh, we can look at. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, perhaps I should explain a bit this uh, panel discussion. We will start off with a sort of a, um, a wider uh, presentation from each and every one on how they look upon the subject. And then we will have shorter uh, questions and answers and sort of a discussion, so um, just to explain. And in the end, we actually will have 30 minutes for a question from the audience. So we uh, have a sort of a participatory uh, panel. Yes, first of all, could you comment a bit? Uh, do you agree with what we just heard before you give your view? Yes, definitely I agree on most of the things which, uh, we have, been which have been discussed. Uh, the question of mindset, uh, I fully agree that uh, this is something which uh, we need uh, to think about and also can I, when, when we talk about mind, sorry, mindset, we talk yes. about like passion and about like finding funding or what, what are we talking no, no, no. about? Yes. So, yeah, <laughs> first of all is the mindset. Are we doing research as Professor said, as a way to generate revenue, yes. extra revenue? Or are we doing research? What I'm talking about, is it still, if you look at it, it's still a partial fulfillment yes. of academic program. It has, um, this is especially when you, you remember the, the presentation of Professor, my professor of microbiology, Professor Mahalo has been talking about uh, research universities, what are the criteria for the research university? And you see it's very different. Our research, we are still, actually, we are still putting a lot of emphasis in teaching. And the research which is being done is mainly as first as a partial fulfillment of a degree program. And the second is the criteria for the promotion. So we need to change our mindset to really use research as a tool to find a solution. And that's why when you hear this morning, we have fantastic achievement in terms of publication, in terms of research output number of our postgraduate, how we have influenced policies, but we haven't seen startup companies image. If you ask, unfortunately, I, I was fortunate to attend a presentation of the, the president of Karolinska uh, University, and uh, you could hear a number of startups which have emerged uh, from this. This is where not yet there. Even our criteria for ranking, this is what's again taken from uh, Professor Mahalu, that has not yet featured. We are still developing. I think it's also good to recognize what the government has done in the last 10 years. Actually, almost from 2010, the government, for the first time, they have really started to increase funding to research. And this was not there since independence. And the CEDA support was really, if you look at it, it's really starting from Utafiti but it was obvious that there was not enough researchers. So we actually moved into supporting individual researchers, where you have all these programs with uh, uh, MOHAS, with UDSM, and, R and RD. And then more recently, we came back to supporting a research system. I think that is very important to understand. It's the system because you need to have an ecosystem before the research is actually moving forward. So our innovation, our ecosystem is still developing. And that's why we see these gaps. But I'm confident that as we move on, most of these things will be addressed. So first, if you ask researchers, they will tell you funding. The government has actually 
really started to put in more funding for research. I remember, I don't know, when I was at Costec, we, uh, there were about more than 500 masters and PhDs were supported through national fund. There was uh, more than 20 research infrastructure which was established. Thirdly, we have put in more money into research projects, uh, more than 50 research projects. But also we managed to attract other funding through that contribution from the government. I think that is a very good starting point. And also we now, I mean, we managed to attract funding from Human Development Innovation Fund, which is really supporting innovation. So we have also to think about looking at the research impact, not only in terms of publication, that's probably its output, if we think in terms of patent, it's only the output, but what is the outcome and impact? And now innovation is also very important. So the mindset which we have of translating research results into companies, into product, we are, that is still a challenge. We, another challenge which we are facing, we have not yet managed to stimulate private sector to invest into R&D. So those, to me, I think is enough for now. Very good, and I think we will come back to many of these points later on, but first of all, uh, Winnie Aster uh, Anderson, Associate Professor at the University of Dar es Salaam Business School. Your take on this major challenges? Well, thank you so much. Um, I totally agree with uh, most of the points raised by previous speakers. I remember the founding father of this nation once he said, when a nation is poor, everything becomes a priority. And uh, if I talk about Tanzania research environment, I see a lot of challenges. Of course, as uh, the previous speaker said, some of the challenges, we are still working on them, but still we have challenges on a number of issues I would like to mention. First of all, I think we have multiplicity of uncoordinated research efforts. Multiplicity of uncoordinated research efforts. As a result, now you have like um, more than 60 research institutions and universities, and every single institution is working on something. Who is doing what, where, when, and for whom? Still, we have this uh, a gap of coordinating it. And therefore, at least you don't know who is doing what. And uh, therefore, sometimes you end up with uh, possible redundancies and uh, duplications of efforts. I think that's uh, one of the area where we should focus on maybe. And uh, as Professor Loga said, uh, we still have this uh, problem of single research efforts instead of multidisciplinarity, research orientation. And uh, of course, as we know, any research with multidisciplinary efforts is more likely to generate more and the more impact it has than the single research. I also think of this issue of underestimating the power of intellectual property rights, failure to identify, register, and commercialize intellectual property rights have led to wastage of uh, resources, again, limited research funds, and over-reliance on donor-funded projects. And therefore, I'm just trying to think if research institutions focus on this, perhaps we can commercialize and get more funds for funding further research. But also we have another issue uh, of the age, the age of population of Tanzania, for example, where we are saying around 60% of the population is the young people below 35 years, 60%. What does it mean? It means even if CEDAR have supported for 40 years, now we have to start again generating more researchers because we are having many young people and trained researchers, 60% of them. 
of our population. And therefore, what you are saying, um, again, we need more funds to, for training more researchers because of this population of Tanzania. But uh, I would wind up maybe by talking about the brain drain. Brain drain, the research institutions are also losing a good number of PhDs. Others going for green pastures. Of course, we have some few going for other government offices. And therefore, if instead of having a person there for training or building capacity for the rest, again, this person is leaving to other offices. And therefore, these are some of many challenges. Thank you. Thank you so much. Rolf Johansson, your take on this? Thank you. Uh, I'll mention uh, three different challenges that I see from different perspectives. Uh, I'm representing a professional discipline that is uh, an academic discipline with very close relations to professions and professionals. And uh, to us, it is a challenge not only to produce evidence-based knowledge, we also have to reach out with it. Uh, so that is, is, is a challenge uh, to the discipline, to the professional discipline specifically. Another challenge to academia as a whole is to transfer from disciplinary research to transdisciplinary research. Uh, that is research, well, that I would say it's a research where problems are identified and framed in the context of application and then academia is brought in, the competence from academia that is needed is brought in, meaning probably from different disciplines. So one of the challenges to academia is to, to manage to cross the borders between disciplines. And I think this is a, a kind of a dilemma because on the one hand, we need to develop real disciplinary in-depth knowledge within our disciplines to strengthen the disciplines. On the other hand, we need to be able to communicate with other disciplines. And uh, we really speak different languages. We might even be educated in very different traditions of scientific thought. It is different kinds of explanations that we accept as scientific, for instance. So to be able to discuss across these borders is a challenge to academia. Uh, I think maybe one solution is to have more philosophy of science in the education already at quite an early stage. I think that is one way maybe to address this challenge, but I think there might be. Isn't that a way also to make it more uh, sort of streamlined and perhaps a bit narrow-minded? Uh, on the contrary, I mean, how can someone who is trained in a positivist uh, tradition of scientific thinking communicate with an historian who is an hermeneutic which, and accepts completely different explanations as scientifically valid? On Twitter. It's very simple, no. Okay. Uh, well, it's not so simple. <laughs> and I think it's a question of education. Yeah, yeah. This has been brought up before, actually 70 years ago by C.P. Snow, but I think the problem is still there. Mm. We mm. haven't solved it. It is really mm. a challenge to academia mm. to do that because we cannot, we cannot uh, uh, leave the... I mean, we still have a demand on really disciplinary knowledge. That is core. And then we have that dilemma of, of also being able to understand and communicate with representatives from other disciplines who are schooled in, in a very different way of thinking. But I think it's necessary if we really want to move into transdisciplinary research because we can have a real life problem out there which actually calls for an historian and a, and a national scientist to, to contribute with their knowledge. They must be able to communicate with each other. And also, it creates another challenge because uh, when we go into transdisciplinary research, it is not only important to communicate results with, with, with the scientific community, it is even more important to communicate back with those who were involved in the, the process from the beginning, who identified the problems and framed the problems. And then maybe a few words about challenges I think uh, the Tanzanian universities have specifically, or maybe ARU that I know, because I started to collaborate with, with RD University when it was a college, university college in the late 90s as a teacher in PhD courses, and I then 
became a supervisor to PhD students. I was amazed when I came into the research environment that are because it's so international. It's only Tanzanians, but it's so international because they all come with an education from different universities around the world and then they come back to our university and they create a, a completely unique research environment, I would say. So that is a, a potentiality, a strength. But it's also kind of a risk in the long perspective because CEDA uh, will opt out and, and maybe uh, there will be a production of local PhDs soon, I hope. More of them, There's the, there, well, there is already, but there will be more of it and, and the foreign support will, will opt out. So the challenge is to, to keep the international network and also to, to still support mo um, mobility, but at the same time avoid brain drain, as we were talking about. It's a dilemma, it's a challenge. Yeah. From a donor's perspective, um, Anna Maria Ultorp, head of research unit, SIDA, uh, your take? Uh, so much uh, white things have, have been said already, but uh, just a, a reflection. Uh, from our point of view, when we are supporting research, we're usually saying that a system is, to some extent, sustainable when there are local PhDs programs available. Uh, so that's clearly one indication so that Tanzania can, can uh, generate the next generation of, of researchers. To, uh, so that's part of it. But then it's, of course, maintaining the research system as such, and that goes with, with many aspects. I think the innovation systems have been uh, um, discussed by quite a few of you, and, and the challenge is there to strengthen that even further, the interaction with society. We also know that many of the future challenges are, are going to be new, and so the system also need to be adapting to, to the new challenges that we are facing. I mean, we often talk today about artificial intelligence, robotics, and, and big data, and how will that transform our societies? And I, I think there, there is a great need of, of both uh, strong basic sciences in, in all countries, but also the strong humanities and social sciences. So th there's a breadth of, of, of competence that is needed. And I also think the international collaboration is clearly a key. And in all this, funding for research because that's really where, where the challenge is, I see. Where will the funding for research be coming from? There is increasing funding coming in from the government, and I, I think that will be a key to, to sustaining the system in the, in the future to, to really continue and, and uh, with, with increasing that, that support, but also making sure that researchers in Tanzania can uh, be part of international research collaborations also in the future. Thank you very much. Many, many interesting points here. So I think we will focus uh, on, on what we were talking about, communication and miscommunication. Um, policy making a bit, because I want to know where uh, Tanzania is heading at, looking at this uh, forward. Um, the mindset, um, and, uh, but also these cultural differences, uh, which are very interesting. What do you say about these cultural differences, uh, if you start commenting on that? I is there uh, a sort of a challenge in uh, being able to communicate? Um, you, you mean the, the differences between the disciplines yes. which have been talking? Of yes, course, I think we, that we have nations going, <laughs> too. But yes, uh, that is going to continue to be a major challenge mm -hmm. because, uh, as um, I mean, she has just mentioned about artificial intelligence, robotics. These are emerging technologies, and I strongly believe they have a lot of potential to transform our country. And uh, the, when we talk with other people on robots, immediately we say, oh no, um, we are going, they are going to replace human. And uh, one of our comparative advantage is, uh, I'm sure Professor Luoga soon, when he's sitting at the Bank of Tanzania, I think it's uh, talking about investments, low labor costs, say this is our comparative advantage. 
But if you look to, if you really go to some of the industries, you will see automation is already there. If you go to Nawasco today, you will see they are using artificial intelligence. So it's, no, it's mainly that ourselves, which we don't understand, that things are already happening. But they do actually happening. I was, uh, I was, I was actually telling Professor Luoga here, I'm surprising that he's here, mm -hmm. but I've mentioned something which he's going to face. One is the blockchain. This is not something which is far-fetched. They're actually here now. But we haven't yet prepared our environment legal framework, cultural, social, to be conducive for, for us to take advantage. Mm -hmm. And some of these things will allow us to leapfrog because we don't have a problem of legacy like what is existing in Europe. Mm -hmm. So it's really the question of trying to see how we can move. And that is also the language barrier. Mm -hmm. How are we going to communicate to be able to, for people to be able to understand between different disciplines. We should find a way to do that. Yes, and, and what is the way? Can someone contribute here? Can somebody see? Yes, so the best way, the solution is really to talk about solution in a language which a common man would be able to understand. Okay, like simplifying, simplifying popularize it, what we were popularize about it in a manner because scientists we are used to communicate among ourselves. We have yeah. been, we are just publishing, mm. and that's how we are the criteria for promotion. But that communication is only among ourselves, mm. not among those who are funding us, those which are mainly funding us as the policymakers. We have been there was a, a I mean, she knows very well there was this. Policy briefs, policy briefs, policy briefs, mm -hmm. a lot, but those actually didn't have a big impact. Is to transform exactly. those into a languages where people will be able, a common person, a popular a communication, where people those will be able to understand, mm -hmm. and really understanding the policy making process itself, that how is it actually happening, uh, and uh, what we also going to be a challenge for us is, uh, uh, I remember when the former. Uh, Vice President, he had a science advisor in his office. Mm. The system of science advisor is which exists in some of the uh, co Commonwealth countries is not yet existing in our in our developing countries. So researchers are like a mouth, but you need also to have an ear in a systematic way, mm. so that we can be able to translate the research finding into policies. So far it's happening in, on ad hoc basis and different countries are trying, mm -hmm. are trying to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. So that is also very so important. So perhaps like the coursing in, in simple writing or things, I mean, lower degrees already? Or I mean, communication? Uh, I think the problem is the other way around. Mm -hmm. It's really to strengthen more those who are making decision to source evidence, to identify the evidence. I I think what we need to, we, we, we are working in, uh, uh, Kostek is working in Zanzibar. They are working with the cabinet secretariat in Zanzibar on how to introduce evidence-informed decision in the process of the government. Mm. So this is the other way around. It's not a question that you produce the knowledge, you simplify the knowledge, you popularize it, but you build up within a system from the user's perspectives on how can we access knowledge mm. and how can we appraise knowledge and how can we use it to prepare cabinet paper. Yes. This is happening now in Zanzibar. And also how to communicate to the big masses. Yes. Your comment on communication, but, and I can just say as a, as a journalist, it's always the problem because you want the researcher and then the researcher talks for like 15 minutes and you're, you're trying to, to, to edit sort of a, a radio program. So it's like, no, you ha I have to cut. And no, 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 you cannot cut. Everything is so important. No, but nobody will listen for 15 minutes. I mean, that is sort of a, a problem we have. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, maybe adding to what Dr. Mshinda has said, uh, communication uh, is effective if there is reciprocal confidence between uh, those uh, uh, who are communicating and uh, the audience of uh, communication. And perhaps is uh, more effective 
when uh, you do not surprise someone with uh, information, with the solution. Solutions must be expected, and uh, therefore there is need to enhance the collaboration between uh, the stakeholders. For instance, you cannot influence government policies if you, supply, you surprise the government with suggestions of solutions. The government might not uh, uh, have the confidence to take it. But if you collaborate with the government to develop a research agenda, you create expectation, you create, uh, uh, you, you make the government get involved in uh, what you are doing, and therefore it becomes part of uh, the research process, and therefore the outcome is an expected outcome. And uh, this makes it more effective than uh, simply uh, doing research and uh, generating a solution. In, in any case, how do you know that, uh, a, 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 leaving aside basic research, how do you know that there is a problem that uh, needs to be looked at uh, and uh, which requires a solution? If there is collaboration, it means even the person or uh, the community that is faced with that problem uh, is able to identify the problem and accept the effort uh, of trying to look for solution. So communication is not limited to publication of results, to collaboration and understanding the need for the research and the expectations of the uh, outcomes. I think this is a challenge that uh, uh, we have to uh, take. I think that's a dimension that I would like to add to. Yeah. And then the solution, I mean, how, how do you, how do you get there? How do you? How do you communicate the solution? No, how, how do we improve the communication? How do we make it better? Yeah, the first is to make sure that uh, whenever you do research, you identify your agenda together with the stakeholders. And therefore you have an audience that expects your communication. And when you make uh, communication available through the various media, it means you, you have an expectant public that also uh, works to look at what is coming in from the research world. Uh, and to see if uh, we already have a, 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 a solution. But if uh, the public is not expectant, then uh, fine, you can uh, publish, but no one has appetite to look for it. Uh, we will also talk about the, like the, the col uh, collaboration with the business community, how to engage that. But first of all, how can different stakeholders in Tanzania society become engaged to support as well as uh, access what we have talked about? How do we improve that? Have you got any idea about that, Professor Anderson? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, um, basically, what I would say, um, all research must be demand-driven. Mm. However, that is also a subject of debate. If it is demand-driven, how do we generate new knowledge? Because um, you need now to have this uh, community, business community, they need some solutions, and then you have these researchers working on their research, and eventually they need to move from the ivory tower to the business community, and then they blend what they have with the needs and provide solutions to the specific problems. And therefore, uh, in this sense, this business community may be willing even to fund the research. At the same time, they want to dictate the results. In other words, they won't dictate to hear what they want to hear. And uh, in that sense, we are saying you have researchers in one side. They do the research which is demand-driven, demand in the sense of uh, this is by the industry or practitioners. And uh, we need to have co-creation workshops so that once you have the results, then you kind of communicate in these workshops, co-creation workshops, on how now to move these results into implementation. 
And uh, who is going to fund the research? Definitely the person who needs it more. One of the challenges that we have is that sometimes you have um, the funders who also dictate the titles. And then you have a researcher who is doing the work or who is doing the research because there was fund for that. There was fund for that, but not he doesn't have any passion on that. I needed that fund. And that's the you know, that's a challenge as well. But that, I mean, if we look at the Swedish um, sort of example, because, I mean, we have the same type of problem. A lot of, of the research is actually funded, most of it is funded by uh, companies and, and the business community. If you could, I mean, how, how, do, we, um, uh, how do we get there and how, how do we mature this sort of platform? Well, we have a model in Sweden we call industry PhDs that are uh, paid by the industry and that comes with a problem formulated in, Already in, in, pre, in, in yeah. industry, yeah. yeah. So that is, well, one way to secure communication and that the results actually will be fed into industry, but there are also challenges in this model. Yeah, because she describes it. I mean, yes. it's, it's, it's a question that the, the researcher does, doesn't have the passion for it, and perhaps the industry needs it to be in certain yeah. Well, way. maybe the problem formulation is uh, yeah. uh, maybe a bit too narrow for, for academia. <laughs> And we are responsible for a PhD education, which is supposed to be quite broad. You're supposed to be a scholar after going through a PhD education. Uh, so that is the challenge with the model, but it, it has pros and cons, mm. I would say. Yeah, but I mean, and, and we have to go there. I mean, that's where Tanzania has to yep. move forward, to be self-sufficient, to have a sustainable research environment. Any comment on that? How, how do we create that? Well, it's, uh, it's a question of being independent of foreign support, and I think that is a long process. It, I mean, there has to be a, a, a strong system of, of uh, economically support to societal needs from within Tanzania. Mm -hmm. I and, and starting I think with policy, policy change, or? <laughs> well, and taxation, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. From a donor perspective? Talking about the sustainability, still yeah. and, and uh, well, do we but need to go? I, I was thinking when you were talking about uh, every all research should be demand driven, and I was thinking a bit. What about the curiosity driven research, uh, which we are, are talking a lot about in Sweden as well, uh, because not one single piece of research necessarily read, uh, come up with with useful results. It's actually research building on other research and, and, and accumulated research that really comes with the breakthroughs. So I think that's really an aspect to take into consideration. Uh, I think the innovation systems and looking at, at the interaction with uh, uh, civil society, government and private sector and the transdisciplinary research is an important part in, in this, as, as you were talking about the transdisciplinary research. But I think we can't leave the other side with, with the basic research we need either. The money. Need, uh, the money is needed, I mean, otherwise you cannot do anything. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a question then of, of mm. how do you prioritize between the two and how can you make sure that you are becoming part of, of applying for international research grants. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something which, which is, is really a, a challenge today, mm -hmm. because uh, mostly when, when research councils come together, it's, it's, they can fund researchers from their own uh, countries. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a research council that come on board and, and look at the global calls, then it's difficult to, to apply as a, as a for example, a Tanzanian researcher. Yeah. So I think that's, that's an obstacle today. So if we stay in your uh, uh, sort of area, what will the aid look like in the future uh, from CEDA to Tanzania in research? Well, I mean, uh, we're, we're approaching the day when, when there are local PhD programs and, and, and where we will have to phase out all, all the support. But I think there are other mechanisms that we are working on today. And I think looking at the sustainable development goals, these goals are universal. These are some goals that we need to address together. 
And I think with the other stuff of our action agenda, which is also highlighting science, technology, innovation, and capacity building, that is clearly on the agenda today. Um, I also recently uh, got access to, to a um, report from uh, Canadian IDRC, International Development Research Centre, who has actually looked at 170 projects and programmes, research projects and programmes, and looked at the research quality of, of that. And it clearly states that um, capacity building aspects do not imply low scientific rigour. It also say that new researchers are innovative and local researchers um, do, uh, do this best. And it also has looked, and, and this is research for development they looked at, and they say that the researcher, research coming from researchers in, in the low-income country or in, in, in the developing uh, world, they do the best research on all quality measures. So it's actually better than northern research on development. And it, it, I don't think this is, is, I mean, it's something I think we've known for quite some time who has been in, involved, that if you don't know the local context, you can't solve the challenges that are ahead of us. And although many of the ch challenges are global, they have a local context to look into. So I think uh, international research will need researchers from all countries, including uh, low-income countries. And I think there is a, a different uh, playing ground today where we try to uh, work with international organizations to see if there are new models to, to uh, engage in, where we as donors can provide some funds that can go to low-income countries, whereas regular research funders pay for, for the researchers in, in mm. those countries and that ha can afford. I think that's one way of moving ahead. Also, uh, looking at, at the Tanzania and if, if we're fa at the time when we're facing out, there are also regional mechanisms that could come in, mm. having collaboration regionally, because there are, are islands of, of good research in, in so As many we said, countries. no borders. Research yeah, right. has no borders. So, so, mm. Dr. Bilal, where do you, uh, if you think about the funding for research, where do you see that? When CEDA are phasing out, where, how will research be funded uh, in the future? I will see a lot of funding coming from the local government. The government itself must allocates money for research. There is no way out of that. And the best way, if you want to avoid the, the discussion, is uh, the, the discussion as to whether it has to be applied research with immediate results or something that is driven by curiosity and interest in of individual research is to create a body like Costec that we, we have done and close your eyes to Costec in the sense that you don't see what they are doing but give them the mandate for them to decide how to apportion the amount of research that goes into applied research and solving immediate problems and how much goes into into generating new knowledge for that matter. I think this is better mechanism of doing that. But also you must create ways of interesting the larger community of what is going on in our research institutions, either through making greater dialogues, courting the policy makers to come and see what is going on in our research institutions so that they can be encouraged to devote some money in, in supplying these research activities in the country. Uh, there was one comment that uh, Dr. Mshinda made, I think, with regards to research universities in Tanzania. Well, I happen to be a, a, a chancellor of Nelson Mandela Institute of Science and Technology. And that is a research university by all standards. 
We only train people at master's level and PhDs. And the research is done from two points of view. The point of view of generating curiosity in what is going on in the country, but also from the point of view of trying to solve some particular problems that are found in, in the society, maybe in energy, maybe in other areas, of, such as nutrition and whatever. But it is research, fundamental research, as well as applied research. So we do have a research university in Tanzania. Mm. It's called Nelson Mandela Institution of Science and Technology. Mm. Professor Luoga, how f uh, is a sustainable research system in Tanzania within reach, or are we very far from? <coughs> Simple Both. question. Yeah. Both. We are within reach, and we have uh, a long way to go. Uh, on one hand, the main impediment of uh, uh, research, as uh, you, 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 you rightly ask, is about funding. Uh, at the moment, there is expectation of donor funding. And there is that perceived feeling that uh, uh, research cannot be internally funded. Perhaps uh, this needs to be uh, changed uh, so that uh, uh, there is uh, a steady source of funding. But how does this arise? Uh, Professor Winesta uh, mentioned about the private sector. The private sector needs research output. But um, what I'm observing is that uh, lack of uh, reciprocity in confidence. We are going through transition, a transition where you find every time you meet members of the, uh, from the private sector, they seem to be issuing uh, directives, directions. Uh, we need institutions to do this, to do this, to do this, to research on this. And sometimes they even give you the answer. We like to have this kind of product. Now, if you want that kind of product, do you need a researcher or do you need a consultant who can simply uh, deliver to you something? I think this needs uh, uh, to be changed. It's a culture. Uh, we have, as institutions, to involve more and more the private sector to see how we can make it easy for them to find solutions, effective solutions, so that we are indispensable. If we are indispensable to the private sector, it means the private sector will always allocate sufficient money to R&D. And this will definitely be accessed by the research communities. And in that regard, I can see that money is there. The funds are there, but how to access the funds and collaborate to carry out research is something that we need to strive to, uh, to, 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 to build together. Similarly, when you look at uh, the government, uh, setting aside budgets and asking the government to finance budgets usually will, not, will be futile because uh, there are a lot of uh, competition to access the funds. But if you understand how the government operates, always government institutions have money to search for solutions. But who is using the money? It's not the researchers. Very often you find money is wasted because there are people with money not knowing what to do with the money and doing it in the wrong way. And you have the researchers who know how to do it and they have not taken the initiative to collaborate with the government institutions so that they are a party to problem, I mean, solution hunting. Once you are there, it means uh, it's very possible for the research institutions to service the government 
and get funds without necessarily setting aside funds for themselves and asking the government to fund it. It's a question of strategy. And that's why once we develop reciprocal confidences and we strategize to collaborate to, together to uh, develop a research agenda and expect to find solution out of it, it means we are part and parcel of the processes, whether within the private sector or within the public sector. In that context, definitely, we can see that uh, it's very possible in the near future to have very sustainable uh, funding of research, very sustainable research. But of course, we research, the challenges are so many. We are talking of uh, uh, moving Tanzania into industrialization, moving Tanzania into this, or finding problems that uh, involves a lot of scientific inquiry. Definitely, in that regard, it means uh, the process of developing expertise will take long, and uh, in that respect, we have to walk a long way. Thank you. We will open up the floor for questions. We have uh, two microphones here. Uh, I think one there we can take, and uh, yes, you have to come up here. <laughs> um, and in the meantime, you have yeah, you just put up your hand and uh, state your name and some short um, questions there. Uh, yeah, we can start with the over there, Mr. Thompson. Over there. Thank you. I'm going to be a bit provocative. Why not research for sustainable development in the title? I think we need to change our mindset. Challenge lazy orthodoxies. Be innovative. Now, the sustainable development goals, that is an excellent framework for innovative thinking. And it's a joint responsibility. These uh, 17 SDGs, 169 targets, that's a complex adaptive system. Huh? That takes intersectoral approaches. It takes inter or transdisciplinary work. Several of you have talked about it. Uh, Swedish Prime Minister uh, promised to support, together with eight other leaders, including Angela Merkel, SDG 17, which is about implementation of the partnership. Isn't this a golden opportunity? Also, funders need to be innovative. Completely new landscape. Huh? Why not twin universities in Tanzania and universities in Sweden? How else is Tanzania, with all the challenges, in spite of the fantastic deliverables, huh, going to meet the expectations with change management? And this is about our common future. Thank you. Yeah, I think that is very interesting, uh, the twinning arrangement, uh, which is uh, very attractive, and especially within the framework of SDG, where Sweden is well known as one of the most innovative countries. After what is happening in Silicon Valley is uh, second, actually is considered as second in terms of innovation, Skype, Sportis, all these things. I think the issue is mainly for my people who are working on the development. Why don't you develop Tanzania to be like that? <laughs> because you are, as a part of the development aid, you are very, this is where you are very good at. But if you look at your package for development, what proportion is really geared towards research and innovation? As you say, this is the really a part, I know it's about 3% in Sweden. You are, what is contribution, it's around 3 point something percent of GDP into R&D. But what proportion of that is in the developing and trying to get there? If we are now a partnership, I think it's the opportunity now of making a twinning arrangement so that we can solve the global problems together. Taking advantage of your progress which you have made and uh, the challenge, our developmental challenges which we are facing. Uh, I think the uh, amount of, of uh, funds uh, within development aid in Sweden uh, going into research is slightly less than 3%, but not much. Uh, but, but still, it's been decreasing as a share of, of the development budget. 
for some years. Uh, but uh, and, and we are, I mean, of course, it's government decisions on, on where to, to put the support. And, and uh, But I would also say that there are innovative ways of, of looking and supporting different uh, aspects within development cooperation. The partner, working in partnerships with different countries and, and uh, it is one part. Also looking at innovative ways of, of doing research. A lot of uh, money going into grand challenges funds uh, globally. But we're also looking into to, uh, maybe collaborating with African Academy of Sciences for a Grand Challenges Africa, possibly, which, which would be geared. It would be interesting, yeah. <laughs> but but uh, I'd say there are other parts of, of, of certainly of development cooperation who, who works close to this. But, but uh, we certainly want to link. Yeah. Yes, I think it's, uh, it's very dangerous if all the donors I know are coordinating at the African Academy of Sciences and forgetting what we have tried to build in terms of partnership in a country where both of us, a government of Tanzania and Sweden are putting money together. So don't follow that. There is no any African government putting money there. That's correct. Look at it carefully. You can discuss it later on. Okay, we had a question there. Uh, who else good? We have two over here afterwards. Yes. I have two remarks to make, make or two questions uh, as far as uh, challenges are concerned. The first one is I was uh, the Golden Bear coordinator of a language project which came to an end in 2012. I was the partner of the University of Dar es Salaam for almost 10 years. I have been longer there. People know I have been a professor at the University of Dar es Salaam, even in Namibia. Now, uh, what brings me to this uh, question? When a project comes to an end, and I became professor emeritus in 2010, this doesn't mean that uh, you, you, you stop. When I look around, I see many senior colleagues, and I don't know how they feel having been left in the dark, but uh, not conducting any research anymore, but they still have the research results. So what happens to these old or senior people? And how, do they, who, how are they supported? I have been to a number of conferences. I founded it myself. Mm -hmm. The other one is uh, when I looked at this uh, CEDAR uh, publication outside, I saw two photos which had to do with seaweed harvesting. Women are doing seaweed, har uh, seaweed harvesting, money in Swahili. And uh, I have uh, a colleague, he's a fisherman in South uh, Zanzibar, in Makunduchi. His wife is uh, one of the seaweed harvesters. You know what they, they got? They got some two Swedish kronos for a kilo of dry seaweed. And I asked now here at the Marine Institute uh, exhibition, and they said it's the same now, so the equivalent of uh, uh, two Swedish uh, crowns. Or, and uh, my question is now, I feel really sad when I conduct a research project, and we, don't pay, we can't pay attention to the social environment, because uh, we, we, we are bound to do our research work but we, we should find a way also to take care of uh, our research, so-called, uh, partners at the grassroots. Thank and, you. and another one, I, 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 I'm doing research now, conducting research on a heavily endangered language spoken by 250 people. And uh, these are hunter-gatherers, so you may imagine that the situation is not very good. And they are starving. So, we can't, as a researcher, we can't support them. They are starving. They go for eight hours for f fetching water and so on. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, CEDA is a strong organization. I feel CEDA has the contact to the government. Not everybody has the contact to the government. Mm -hmm. But we should go beyond uh, this, uh, just the focus on research. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So short, um, taking care of uh, older sort of experience and researchers. Who wants to comment on that one? I, I could quickly yeah, comment, please, but then, please. Uh, then uh, ask my Tanzanian colleagues. I, I think what, what we've done in terms of, of uh, 
the collaboration is to put more and more ownership in the hands of, of the Tanzanian researchers and, and the universities. And today, when, when we start a new partnership, it's actually based on a concept note produced by the universities. So based on that, Swedish researchers can come in and, and apply to participate, and it's a great interest. The last round, there was 72 uh, applications coming in, and I, I think Within the concept note, there are some priority fields that are, are being identified by the universities, uh, and, and, and that's the basis we go on. And I don't think we can continue to work maybe within the same fields forever. And, and, and it, uh, so, so uh, I, I think that's sort of a, a more generic answer um, to that. How about the older uh, researchers and how, how do we Well, guess? I'm one of Professor Emeritus, but I don't think I have to be taken care of much. Uh, <laughs> we have to prioritize, and what I think is very important to prioritize is the PhD students that we now educate, they have to go into research. They must have the opportunity to do research after mm. the PhD education. So I would, I would prioritize that. Mm. So, yes, questions, uh? short questions. Yes. Short question. Yes. Um, and, and, and introduce yourself. Yes. It's Adam, Adam Payne, Swedish University. I've been struck by the bias towards an instrumental view towards education in the discussion that I've heard. Education for growth, education for development. And actually to pick up on the comment on sustainable development, I mean we should remember in the past that education was as much about values, morals and, and, uh, and, and other qualities. And it would be a pity to lose sight of that, because I think that is equally relevant to the sustainable development agenda, whatever you might think about it. Yeah. But going on from that, and I think Alison Wolf's book, An Educationist in the UK, who seriously questioned the links between education and economic growth. She actually also, this was a book written in the 19, about 2005, a very important book. But she also raised this question of the challenges that expansion bring to the education system. And I've been very struck that we've had no discussion today of what's actually going on in the education system as a whole in tertiary education in Tanzania. An enormous expansion of universities, of numbers. Universities have expanded at a kind of declining finance per, 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 per educationist. We have, I believe, this year, the University Commission has suspended 19 universities of the 26 from admitting students, undergraduates, into the course because of quality issues. There are some very serious, wider structural challenges at play in the education system that raise major questions of exactly how you are going to promote research excellence and research contribution in a system that seems to be driving itself into the ground. Who wants to take that? I think, um, Professor Noga, no? Do you have a microphone? You can have a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, this uh, problem is a challenge, and uh, it's a challenge that is faced uh, in a situation, for instance, like Tanzania, when uh, all of a sudden you have uh, all the youth needing to access higher education. And uh, you are opening up higher education from a predominantly public higher education system. You are bringing in a private sector uh, before having uh, uh, quality uh, safeguards in place. And then you discover that uh, higher education is a commodity. Uh, and poses a danger to all of us. Uh, this is what uh, has happened, but uh, it's something that is uh, a transiting. That's why, that's why there have been that uh, closure, while at the same time putting in place uh, systems and rules that will ensure that uh, there is quality uh, education. So I wouldn't say that uh, the system is uh, driving uh, <laughs> education and research to the ground. It's a challenge that has to be sorted out. Thank you. About the structural perspective, anyone wants to comment, comment on that? The instrumental, uh, yeah. the instrumental view of education. Exactly. Anyone? <laughs> 
We will discuss it afterwards then. Thank you as a comment, yes. We have behind there. <laughs> My name is uh, Professor Alphonse Kesi from Ard University. I think uh, I'm also retired, <laughs> uh, but in this, in this government we have, uh, professors are given a chance to work up to 70 years if they are, they are still in, uh, active. So uh, uh, I'm sure also in the North, we have uh, Professor Emeritus and also, so we are actually involved. Uh, what I, I was thinking of is that uh, some of the researchers who have finished their PhDs, they come back, actually they are frustrated. Because they want to continue, they cannot. They've done a wonderful job. We are now probably coming thinking about postdoc, but I think they've done a wonderful job. Let's say I'm, 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 I'm working in the human settlements, and they wanted to implement, but they cannot. So I was thinking probably that is what we should now think of, research uh, and also and development. But the second part is not taken care of so much. It's left out. And if somebody has done a very good research, let's say on water supply or on sanitation improvement, but you cannot continue, she cannot continue with that. When you go around the art university, the settlements which are around the art university, their uh, sanitation is very poor. It's not improved. And they, are, they know Ardin University is Ardin University, University of Salam, they are very close nearby. And this is because there's no funding for applied research. So I was thinking probably we should now move a st next step. 40 years of research we have developed, I think, a very good capacity is already on the ground. Now we need to go to the implementation stage. And I think if we could do that, then you will see automatically we are with the communities, we are with the industries, the industry will come to us. Because they don't see our impacts on the, on the ground. And I think that's where probably CEDA should, uh, and uh, I was expecting probably uh, the panelists to comment on that, to see on where really uh, CEDA now should put their mouth. Should we continue? Capacity building, I think, is already there. Should we continue the way we are doing this? Or we should now go to the next stage, the third stage? Capacity building, training, and now research for development? That's my question. Yes, I, I, I think what is also good to inform you what has happened recently. When I was at Costec, we, uh, we realized that uh, I think the support which it has really produced was mainly looking at the systems and, to, and really research training. So now you are really going to the phase which I would encourage to move into the phase of research. One of the things which we have been trying to introduce is a postdoc, which was not there before. And these uh, postdoc, uh, we are trying to address on both sides. On one hand, trying to see how could we prepare a career structure which postdoc will be recognized within our establishment. And that, I think, is probably, I'm not sure, it's in the final stages. The second aspect which we touch this, this question of the language also is uh, we put the money together. As I mentioned, when the government actually funded research, we tried to use that money for attracting other funds. So we put up a, a, a pilot program on supporting postdoc, where we equally funded between CEDA, the Dutch organization, which calls NWO, and COSTEC. And uh, this as the in the, under initiative of essence, where we fund the project, and one of them was actually on the, I think it's on the language, is really the question of, uh, and it was funded as a postdoc. So we, as a way of supporting the system, we want to really to push that the postdocs should be a culture, which need to be established. We are also thinking we had this big expectation of creating also the research chairs. And our research chairs, what, the way we are thinking is not only purely in academic, but also at the industry or at the policy level. Through that process, we thought that that could also be a very good career for a researcher. So the research as a career is not only as an, academy, as an academician, but you can also combine as a career. So I'm sure now even the next, the current CEDA support is putting a lot of emphasis on postdoc. Anyone want to add anything? Yes, you have the microphone. 
a different angle, of course. <laughs> um, what Dr. Mshinda has revealed to us is that there can be quite a lot of initiative from their point of view of, of COSTEC. That means they can generate directions, they can generate agenda on what should be done about research provided without the interference from the government. And I think this is healthy. This means that we can, through dialogue or through communication with other stakeholders, create an agenda of what should be done or what can be done in research. Because they have taken the initiative to do that and it has been very welcome in the government. I just want to say that the government has played its part very honorably on this ground. Thank you. Questions, yes, up here and then over there. But first, yeah, the third row. row. Yes, good. Thank you. I'm Evelyn Richard from Jurassa Dar es Salaam Business School. Uh, my question is uh, the issue of uh, mindset, the change of mindset. I find it is, it's very critical, but it's also complex because we are talking about the researchers in one side, we're talking about the public sector, the private sector, and the donors on the other side. And the resistance to change is another big challenge. Now, my question is, uh, from the experiences, do we have any best model to speed up, you know, the process of changing the minds of these different groups? Thank you. Yes. Anyone? Yeah, have, have a go. Yeah, um, that's a very interesting question, and I think we need to establish this public-private partnership and dialogues. At the same time, you see, uh, this development is culture, and the culture is some, sometimes you learn some issues from the rest. As we do exchange programs, as we go to Sweden, for example, you come back with different thinking altogether. And that thing is very useful for us. And, uh, and I think when we are talking about building or developing, for example, the in-country programs, that element, again, is going to suffer. Going to Sweden, coming back with some kind of new culture or new, you have learned something, you want to communicate about it and teaching others how to do it and communicating with the rest of the community how Swedish behave, how the businesses, how the scholars behave, etc., etc. That's very important. Again, coming to your issue is the same feeling. We need to borrow from abroad and we need to communicate. We need to work together, academia, industry links. And if we improve that area, linking industry with, with the academia for the rest of uh, what we are doing in research, I think it is going to work. We cannot remove everything and get 100% improvement, but at least some elements of improvement can be seen. Happy with that answer? Good, yes, so we had another question back. Yes, please introduce yourself as well. Thank you, my name is Jon Heike Ås. I work at the Norwegian Embassy. Um, congratulations to both Sweden and Tanzania for your 40th anniversary. Um, I've been following this discussion with interest, uh, especially the, the parts of it that uh, addresses uh, the um, financing, the funding situation for, for research cooperation. And I was thinking, <clears throat> have you considered uh, twinning not only research institutions, but also research councils? Uh, we have some, uh, some experience with that in Norway, uh, which has been quite successful. Uh, and this is both for joint funding of research, uh, but also for, for joint applications for, uh, for example, the European Research Council, which is the world's largest research council. So it might actually be uh, <clears throat> an innovative take on, on research funding. Thank you. Yes, I think uh, that is uh, when, when I, with, within COSTEC, when we were working on looking at what will be the uh, way, best way of mobilizing resources for, for, for Tanzanian researchers, 
we have realized there are a number of programs, research programs which were ongoing uh, directly between universities and universities. So what we did with, um, first we started with Sweden because of the interest on research. We said, could we try to see, since we are setting up a national agenda, we have the mandate, can we put our money together? So we have been very successful with Sweden. And uh, as part of this program, COSTEC is working with Swedish Research Council, uh, really to strengthen also the capacity in terms of reviewing proposals, how to put up call, how to prepare, monitor the evaluation, how one is actually working on research integrity. We also started to work with the uh, Danish, I mean with, no, with, uh, Den, with Danida through the Danish Research Council, where, where they are also now processing their, their, the, 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 the call for proposal for specific initiative on that, or on the same way. But even within the region itself, we are working very close with South African National Research Fund, uh, we are, where there is a specific initiative of Science Council. For South Africa, we are also putting funding together between COSTEC, Tanzanian government, and, uh, and also NRF. What I think we have tried also to do within the COSTEC is um, not only in terms of looking at the allocation in terms of the budget, but also trying to get another resources from the telecom companies, which is the tele telecommunication traffic monitoring system, which the government has agreed part of that to be also directed to research and innovation. Another part which, uh, since you are coming from Norway, which would be also very good to learn, is we haven't yet optimized the process of getting funding the, through FDI, especially in, in the natural, resources, natural resources. Because the only way, the only way which to me I'm also now more convinced for our countries to leapfrog in terms of research is to take advantage of our natural resources. When investors are coming in, they could also support the R&D. Because it's only through that process you will be the owner of the knowledge. A good example is how Petrobras actually developed capacities in terms of gas uh, exploitation, oil and gas, in Brazil. It's all because there was a joint program of uh, risk, of not only of investment, but also on funding where the new knowledge which was actually generated through that process was actually owned by Petrobras and they've actually managed to create companies and the intellectual property. Thank you. Thank you, and that will be actually the final word from this um, uh, panel. Thank you very much for your very interesting contribution in, in this panel. We have the opportunity to listen to important uh, contribution when it comes to mindset, cultural barriers, and who is setting the priorities. And really important was also the discussion on policy-related matters on how the research can support the overall goal to serve uh, the needed communities at large and to fight poverty, of course. And I think you managed to focus, uh, keep focus on the real challenges that the research communities in Tanzania are facing. Uh, we have been discussing the development over 40 years and how uh, the cooperation has matured in spite of a number of challenges. There were also concrete proposals on how the collaboration can further develop and how the research environment can improve. Uh, I hope we can continue with all this also after this panel discussion, but thank you so much for coming. You could all leave the stage now, thank you so much.